there is a little bit of conspiracy in this, I guess. These are two amazing things that are, the first one is an amazing thing that no one knows anything about and how it worked. The second one is perceived <coughs> wisdom and how it can't possibly be true. So just two small subjects. I apologise for those of you who have seen some of this before, um, but I've just rehashed it a little bit just for a short talk. Edward Leeds Scanlon, five foot tall, seven stone two pounds, Latvian, born 1887 and died 1951. At the age of 26, he was in Riga. I'm going to make the light a little bit more romantic when I talk to you. Oh, you might agree with me. Oh, you've got to send it to Yes. He was 26 and he had a childhood sweetheart who was, he was due to marry. And the day before their marriage, she jilted him. And so he was very sad and he sort of sobbed this. I'm going away, <coughs> and he went to America, and settled in Florida City. Now he said something that was quite interesting. I have discovered the secrets of the pyramids and have found out how the Egyptians and the ancient builders in Peru, Yucatan and Asia, with only primitive tools, raised and set in place blocks of stone weighing many tons. Now that's quite a claim, because if we look at the pyramids, really, based on what the archaeologists tell us, we, they could not have built a structure like that to those tolerances with the ancient tools that they were supposed to have. Remember, they didn't have iron at the time of the pyramid, so the archaeologists tell us they're using copper tools, and yet they built this fantastic structure. And he thinks that he found out, and not only did he think it, he went about showing the world how it could be done. He built the Coral Castle. It was originally named Rockgate Park, and it's listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Has anybody been? Yeah? There it is. Fantastic. There's the castle. That was where his living quarters were, and there are other features that we're going to look at in a minute there. He built it on his own in 1920. He single-handedly put in place 1,100 tons of rock over a period of 20 to 25 years. On his own, he built that place. He quarried the coral from the shore where there was, and he, and he brought it up, he carved it and erected it single-handedly. In the mid-1930s, all this was moved from Florida City and it's moved to its current location where it is now in Homestead, Florida. He took the whole lot with him. Let's have a look at a bit of detail there. This bit, that's a gate. It's called the Nine Ton Gate. And it is so well balanced that a small child can actually, with one finger, rotate that gate. It's just so finely balanced and you can see various bits of it, the quarry and the there. That's called the throne room there. You can see there are various sort of half moon shapes all to do with his native Latvia and stuff, but, but, but these are massive chunks of rock. This one obviously being called the 30 ton stone weighs approximately 30 tons. And so therefore he has erected a 30 ton stone on his own. Now, if you wanted to move something to 30 tons nowadays, you would need a, a gang. You would need a gang and a very large crane. And he had neither of those, no very large crane, no gang. So single-handedly, he erected and mined that piece of stone, which is phenomenal, really. There's a close-up of the nine-ton gate. What happened was, it's 92 inches tall and 21 inches thick. And no one could discover how such a small man could make, because that guy in the picture there is probably six foot tall. So you can imagine half of the height of the stone would have been his height. So it's, 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 it's on a pivot. There is a rod that goes right the way down through the middle of that stone. And what happened is, in 1986, the gate stopped opening. 
So they got a team of engineers in, and what they did was they put new bearings on it, replaced the shaft, put new lubrication and rebonded the stone with state-of-the-art adhesive. And some energy sensitive people will get headaches while they're standing inside that archway um, because it's thought to be erected over a vortex. There's some energies that are running around there. And one of the theories about him moving to home instead might have been that the telluric energies he was after were stronger where he moved to. Whereas what happened also, he got, I think he got mugged once when he was in Florida City and didn't like the city, so he moved out into the countryside and took the whole lot with him. That's what the bearing looked like. He had drilled a perfect hole from one end of a piece of rock, a nine-ton piece of rock, through to the other. You would be hard-pressed to do that with today's technology. You would have to do, have laser-guided cutting equipment which would be able to take it through. But he did it single-handedly with just primitive tools. So that is an amazing feat of engineering. That's the castle. That was his living quarters when he was alive. He, people used to look over the, the fence. Small children especially used to creep up. They used to hear him whistling and singing in amongst the stones, but whenever they looked over the edge, he could always sense that he was being watched and he would immediately stop and turn around and they'd all run away. But singing to the stones was a preoccupation of his. Whether that had anything to do with the way he moved them um, is unclear. But he knew something about levitation and he knew something about magnetism. This was in his workshop. Those are magnets that are fastened to a rotating device. No one knows what it was for, but there's a book which I discovered only two days ago while I was doing a bit more research on this, and there's a book talking about him and magnetism, which I ordered, so maybe I'll know a little bit more next time. 25 feet high, 28 tons. On the top there, that's a Latvian star that carved. Now, a couple of strange things happened to do with that stone. When he moved to Homestead, he had to use a flatbed lorry and a transport company to take his bits of rock for him. His skill wasn't enough to be able to transport the whole lot there himself. So, the guy turns up with a lorry, and this stone is laying on the ground, and the guy with the lorry says, where's the crane then, how are we going to do that? He said, don't worry about that, pop out and get a cup of coffee, and." Um, when you come back, I'll have it sorted. The lorry driver went round the corner, he heard a crash, he came back, and that piece of stone was lying on the back of his lorry. Mm -hmm. right. So this is, this is the, a, a lorry driver saying how it happened. Then he delivered it to Homestead, and it was on the back of his lorry, and Ed told him to, to, to come back in the morning. And when he came back in the morning, not only was that piece of rock no longer on his lorry, but it had been erected in place. So Ed, single-handedly, had done, moved a 28-ton piece of rock and assembled it like that. This is phenomenal stuff. And I mean, you can imagine, there was an estimation that they must have needed about 25,000 to 100,000 people to build the pyramid, based on how archaeologists tell us it was constructed by pouring up those massive boulders and um, slotting them in place. But if you had a few people like Ed, you could have built it quite quickly. Moving away from Ed, we're going to have a look at this baby now. This, this is an obelisk, a Karnak, one of the pair, 450 tons and 30 meters high. Now, I'm banding around weights like 450 tons, but I want to try and put that in perspective for you because to actually shift something like that is a major engineering feat, even with cranes and things that we've got now. The crane would have to be massive to be able to get the purchase on that. The ancients managed to put that up. There is this strange feeling that the further you go back in time, the stupider we were. And that primitive people didn't have the technology that we've got today. And so therefore, how could they have done it? But what happens is, 
we've been through a series of technology rising up, being at the top of its game, and then coming back down again, and we lose the whole lot. Now, if you imagine that that's not possible, imagine that tomorrow morning we wake up and there's no electricity. Imagine that you turn your light on, you go and on the phone, there's no phone signal, and with a hand-powered shortwave radio, you manage to find out that electricity on the planet has ceased to work. What would you do? Computers, useless, gone, finished. The battery backups would die within a matter of days. That would be the end of that. And if electricity stopped working, even generators would stop working, because nobody really knows how it works properly. So what would happen would be is we would teach our children not about computing, we would teach them how to farm. We would teach them how to grow things because all of a sudden that would be the most important thing on the planet is to actually know how to grow your own food. And within a generation, it would be only the grandparents that knew about computers in a distant memory and within three generations, the last surviving person who'd ever seen a computer would have died. That's how quickly technology can disappear. It can take three or four generations and something is prevalent, like we all rely on satellites and the net now, take it away and we would forget about it in a hundred years. And so thousands of years ago, who knows what they knew and what we don't know now. Give some idea of weight. A snooker table. One time. Do you think that all of us, if we had a snooker table here, would be able to move that snooker table from one end of the room to the other? There's enough of us in there. Yeah. Hmm. Why would we not be able to do that? We'd be able to pick up a tongue between us, surely, only 30 of us. We could push it. Probably do it all at the same time. It is. The difficulty is. You can only squeeze a finite number of people around these sides of that table. When you move full size snooker table, you've got to take the slate out and move the slate separately and then move the wood and everything else afterwards because there's not enough people can fit round a snooker table to be able to move it. So that's impossible to move even if we had 30 burly men. 30 burly men would not fit around the outside of that table. They're too big. There would be too much room, they wouldn't be able to get a good purchase on it. So this is one of the big problems with heavy weights, but that fact is important, as we'll come on to in a minute. There's one of these on the Swanage Light Railway, that weighs 37 tonnes. So what we're talking about is, Leeds Scarning managed to pick up one of those on its own, move it on its own, and turn it up on its end on its own. This is the sort of weight that we're talking about. A large blue whale biggest thing alive on the planet, 150 tonnes, and we're still talking about that obelisk is twice, three times the size of a blue whale in weight, and yet people manage to put it up in position, two of them, right? This one, which is still left in Asma and they never took it out of the ground, is 42 metres long and would have weighed 1,100 tonnes once finished. Now, how do you manage to get that out of the ground? Right? They had copper tools. Copper's no good against granite. You can bang away for ages with it. They had to use something else. And what they used was diorite balls. Right? Diorite is a very hard mineral. It's harder than granite. And so, therefore, if you bash granite with it, what happens is you would chip bits away and all of a sudden you would be able to actually shape the granite. This is what archaeologists tell us they used, diorite balls. <clears throat> so, how long would it take using diorite balls to dig that trench? Now, because of our snooker table problem, we know that only a finite number of people will be able to fit around that obelisk at any one time. They can be relieved, they can be taken out and other people put in. Somebody's getting the diorite balls ready for them for when they finish with them. But how long would that take? Because we know by banging a diorite ball against a piece of granite, we know what the chip rate is. We know how much it gets out at any one time. 
Here's the maths. You have to trust me on that. <laughs> 50,285 hours. If it was a 10 hour day, that's only because it gets dark. It's not because they would run out of people, because they'd have plenty of people to, to do this sort of work. 320 day a year, that's 15 years it would take just to dig that trench around the outside of the obelisk. Then you've got the undercut. <clears throat> that can't have been a very good job, surely, can it? You have to go down underneath the obelisk and be chipping away as you go through. And it's a little bit more difficult to do, so therefore the amount of time it takes goes up. All right? So to cut, and what did they do when they did the last bit? Did they leave a little bit at either end holding up the obelisk? Um, what happened to the person who was underneath who eventually knocked that away? It was 110 tons over them. I mean, we're not talking about ropes being able to hold this up. To hold up 110 tons is a pardon? What about levers? Levers? Yes, you can. You would have to have, and maybe that's how this one cracked. This one was left where it was because a crack appeared on it. Right. You could. You'd have to have something like many hundreds of feet long that you could lodge in there. To, yes, you could. Levers is a good way that maybe they did it. They haven't put themselves in a very good position because I would have thought they'd have wanted flat either side so you could get a double motion and get somebody underneath to chip it away. But that would take another 34 years to do the undercut. Right? So. 50 years it would take, and all you have to do then is finish it and engrave it. All right? That's how long it would take. Now, obviously there are two of them, but two teams working, so it's the same amount of time. But, written on the bottom of that obelisk, there is a cartouche which actually says, the pair of obelisks were quarried and raised into position in a seven month period. That's 37 times quicker than we worked out it would have to be for diorite balls. So, there were some things that we don't know that they knew at those times. And there have been a lot of theories about this, especially when it comes to um, the building of the pyramids, granite especially, because the Iron Age hadn't yet come to Egypt, according to the archaeologists. And this is another thing that came up with Roger's thing, Scientists and archaeologists, when they have a theory, they do not want to hear anybody disproving the theory on which they base the lifetime's work. Because it's not good for them, because they've got to start again. For example, there was a group of boats that were found off the coast of Maine, and inside were amphora, Roman amphora filled with wine. Now, did they say... Blimey, the Romans made it across the Atlantic. That's good. We'll have to remember that. No, they didn't. They said, ah, this must have been a modern day collector who picked up that stuff, sailed it across without anybody's knowledge, and crashed off the coast of Maine. That's how the Roman amphora got there. And in that book, Forbidden Archaeology, there's another case of a woman, I think she was in England. She got a big piece of coal. In those days, you used to get big bits of coal. We used to have a coal hammer. We don't see many coal hammers now because it's all been broken down for us. But she whacked on the piece of coal to break it apart, and inside was a gold bracelet embedded in the coal. What does this mean to have a gold bracelet embedded in a piece of coal? What it means is there were people wearing jewellery <laughs> walking around at the time of the dinosaurs. Because that was the time when the coal layer was laid down, when all that lush vegetation rotted and was compressed to make the coal and shale that we've got now, there must have been somebody walking around with a nicely made gold bracelet at that time. And so therefore, those things get pushed to one side as being impossible. Yes, Joe. Another theory I thought about that was time travel. You send somebody back, you'd send out to back in time try and test things. So imagine if, if a gold bracelet was sent back to that time. Yeah. True. Then I mean, it would be actually formed into that. Fine. Um, 
there's one thing that I've got that I can't reconcile about time travel. I'd like to think it exists. One of my favourite films is The Butterfly Effect, which actually... I like films where they deal with time travel in a really concise way, and The Butterfly Effect is one of those films. But, if they have invented time travel, why isn't anybody coming back now and telling us about that? Because they... Yeah, I think we do the government's Maybe. We're not going to tell us, are we? No. No, maybe not. But that, that's, you know, I would have thought we'd have done that by now if they'd actually invented it in the future. Maybe it's on the last No. So, there are technologies then. Lead Scanlon knew how to levitate stuff for short, otherwise he could never have built Coral Castle on his own. And the Egyptians had something else. Something else which we don't know about now. Now we've started to find out a few more things. Have you ever heard of Brown's gas? <laughs> Brown's gas is achieved if you use electricity on water and electrolyze it, it turns into H2O2 and you get hydrogen and oxygen in two separate tanks. If you then mix that gas and focus it and ignite it it burns at 150 degrees centigrade. There's a car that's just come onto the market using water as fuel. Have you seen that? Do you know when the first water car was developed? 1860. 1860, they had a car powered on water using just this technique where they used electricity to turn that water into hydrogen and then burn the hydrogen to propel the car. Where did it go in 1860? Mm -hmm. Why don't why aren't why aren't the hydrogen? Pardon? There's an Australian guy that was doing it for some time. Why aren't the hydrogen atoms in the water? Yeah, there's there's an awful lot of things which we've discovered that they don't want to come out just yet. Only when well, only when we've used up every drop of oil on the planet will these inventions start to come out. Because we're there already, that car that runs on water. And so therefore, if you use Brand's gas and it burns at 150 degrees centigrade, something really weird happens. They make, in China, Brand's gas generators now. You can buy one. And so you fill it with water and it produces a gas and it only produces the gas as you need it. You can cut through a fire brick with Brown's gas. You can cut through glass, crystal, you can cut through anything with Brown's gas. And yet, you can put your hand.